Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In my desk drawer, I keep a couple of very important files. One is labeled sorrow. And just after that one is one labeled sunshine. The sorrow file has funeral bulletins in it, but it also has newspaper clippings of particular events that saddened my heart. It's got projects that I started or participated in that either never got off the ground or went in a totally different direction. It's got painful, nasty grams in it. You'd think I'd let those go. But the only reason I keep them is because at a different point in life, I might learn something from them or be able to use that as fuel in ministry for some reason, somehow. The sunshine file is thankfully much larger than the sorrow file. It has love notes from former students and parishioners, newspaper clippings that are steeped in hope and goodness, fond memories, things that make my heart sing, and a very amusing collection of cartoons and clippings that I can't seem to part with just yet. One of my favorite sayings is, coffee snorts burn. And sometimes we need a good coffee snort, don't we? Our house guests last week and we were recalling a poster that's in one of my sunshine files. It was Lenore Run University that year proudly advertising a musician named John Cheek. John Cheek. Now, he was a fantastic pianist. It was rather unfortunate that the poster had a typo in it that kind of goes with our parable today, unfortunately. When you take the I out of something and you add manure, think about this. The typo was, come to see Dr. John Cheek. He's giving a piano rectal. <laughs> Not a recital. When you're Dr. Cheek, that's pretty bad. The best one for today's text, though, would probably be the cartoon with a painter on a ladder in a church. It's based on a much longer joke, and you've probably heard it, but the punchline for both the joke and the cartoon is, repaint and thin no more. Admittedly, there should probably be a third category of file, somewhere in between those two. Maybe call it salve. You know, sorrow, salve, and sunshine. Salve would be the file that holds the things that are useful, even though they can be painful for a second. A lot of my dark humor cartoons would go in there. <laughs> the ones that make you go, ouch, oh, I should probably pay attention to that. In my sunshine file is a cartoon that might fit. It has someone leaving the church, very upset, adamant, because their worship experience had not been what they had expected. Pastor, I was disappointed in worship today, to which the pastor replied, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you. Mmm. Ouch. But funny stuff. So from my sorrow file, at a North American Lutheran Church pastor's retreat, why do they call those retreats? You're working. A retreat is kick your feet up, right? A yeah, okay. Entreat is what I would prefer to call them. Former Bishop John Brodowski stated the following. Translating the impulsiveness of our secular world into our Christian lives causes many Christians to be confused and struggle. Believing we should have peace and rest right now. No waiting. For our faith, God should bless and reward us with a lack of problems. Christians shouldn't have problems with their marriages or difficulties raising their children. Christians shouldn't ever get sick. Christians shouldn't have trouble paying their bills. Congregations should never struggle. Pastors should not experience loss. The peace, joy, and bliss of heaven ought to be ours immediately, instantly, right now. There should be privileges to be a Christian. There should be part of our membership. Hmm. He continued from there, but the gist of his statement sounded a bit like Paul in Romans 1. Yes, they knew God, but they would not worship him as God or even give him thanks. 
and they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols. Some people call it prosperity gospel. When we choose to ignore how we were formed, by whom we were formed, and what God has to say to us through this living word that we read, we allow a culture, any given culture, to form us, not God. Trusting our own feelings and emotions as a tool for life more than trusting God with our lives. It's a confusing, compounding volunteerism of digging into the darkness to discover that the idols that we're digging for might just be ourselves, our ideas, our personal truths rather than the truth of the one who formed us and knew us before we were even knit in our mother's wombs. We can be enlightened if we want. That's good. But we must be careful when our enlightenment does not include the light of Christ. When we choose to align with powers that do not possess the power that God does. And we just spoke two weeks ago with Jesus resisting the temptations of the devil in the wilderness. Remember that? Last week, we heard Jesus calling Herod a cunning fox. Remember that? That's the Savior I want to follow. Jesus is the only one I know of who can thumb his nose at the devil himself and get away with it so efficiently. The only one who can see and speak to the powers of leaders that would intimidate me beyond all recognition, that's my leader. He's the only one who not only tells me what I can do for a more fulfilling and joyful life, but he showed me how. He tells me how. So rather than a quick fix type of daily living for things that do not satisfy us, we can intentionally try to choose to suffer some pretty painful stuff in this life because we know that the things that will rule us in this world, if we allow them to, are absolutely no match for what we gain for eternity when we trust Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. That is why we study God's Word. So entirely critical is that. That is why we try to live into the promises we made at baptism and at confirmation. That's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. We want you back in church. And at weddings. And at ordinations. And at installations. The answers to life's most difficult questions is never I alone will do that. The absolutely truthful answer is always some form of I will and I ask God to help and guide me. That is why we come to Jesus' table so hungry, yearning to receive what he alone gives as he whispers our name. That is why we can contend with agendas and worldly cultures that consistently compete for our attention and devotion and yet have the conviction to resist succumbing to them. We're not looking for quick fixes that satisfy us temporarily and leave us once the thrill is gone. We are looking to the way, the truth, and the life without whom none of us would see our Heavenly Father face to face. We yearn for purpose. We yearn for meaning. Now, last Wednesday at Lenten worship, I discussed with our brothers and sisters in Christ at Salem the issue of name tags. You know name tags, right? My name is, or hello, my name is. We discussed how the lessons we learned from Cain and Abel in your devotional Help us to see motive and response as we attempt to live out reflecting Christ in our daily lives. What goes on our name tags? Hello, my name is, whatever your passion might be. Hello, my name is, your actual given name. What about, hello, my name is Christian. 
We who believe in God and his power and his word can have the unfortunate name tags also assigned to us. Hello, my name is Intolerant because we're absolutely intolerable to the culture in which we reside sometimes. Can't think for yourself instead of praying to this imaginary God for what you want? No. No, I can't. And my big G God is not imaginary. I do not want to be making my life decisions without him. I am not strong enough for that because I'm a sinner who needs the redemption of my Savior, and his name is Jesus. This table up here, it's for sinners only. Perfect people need not apply. I've had no less than three conversations this week in which I was basically told, God is not perfect, so we just have to help him figure out who we are. I needed a chiropractor appointment after each one of those idle-driven statements. Do not make assumptions about who those people might be because I'm pretty sure you'd be wrong. But isn't that the crux of the conflict involving any given culture and what I refer to as a divinity crisis? Thank you, Tim Christ, for that label. A divinity crisis. This is attempting to reduce God Almighty to any number of little G's that run around in our lives rather than clinging to the vine that produces life and abundance in us. I don't need pruning. That stuff hurts. You leave me and my fig tree branches alone. I will produce how I want to and let God sort it out later. Now that part, they got right. God absolutely will sort it out later. He promised us he would. Many humans may be surprised to discover that the final judgment call is not theirs to make. That's Jesus and Jesus alone. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, said this. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Woo, the culture thinks. But it's true. If you have ever had any kind of lasting relationship with another human being on the face of the earth, you know that that is true. Relationships are a series of dying to oneself so that your continuing relationship will rise and be stronger alongside someone else that you would have been alone without. Jesus knows a sinner when he sees one, no matter how hard we try to hide it. Rather than let our idle machines run by idle things, he went to a cross to wipe those grimy smudges of sin right out of us. He did not leave us to die in our sin. He went there to a bloody death to rise again miraculously and take us with him. Our solid rock did us all a solid and we need Jesus' defense from evil. We pray earnestly for that defense every single time we say the Lord's Prayer. Think about it. Deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation. And he's listening. Dominus has nothing on him. He's delivering and delivering and delivering and delivering. Whether it was Galileans offering sacrifices at temple of all places, they were doing the right thing and yet were killed by Pilate. Or if it's some random fellow of a tower in Siloam, Jesus made the point that our end is coming. And we need to have a sense of urgency about who and what we are following. And if it's not Jesus, we should expect an unloving response. Doom. Jesus did not take the time to rank sins with scorecards in his explanation either. His point was consistent repentance for all, for whatever our individual sins may be. Jesus delivers the truth, not our own, but the power of God Almighty truth. Plops it down right into our heads to be open and read and studied. Jesus delivers his cleansing power in wiping our sins away. 
But here's the thing. How do we humans learn to trust at all? If sin enters into the picture and there is no apology for the wrong, not just one of those little sorry game sorries and I'm out of here and I'm going to bump you and keep going, but a real apology. If there is no apology for the wrong, the other party can inwardly forgive you and have their own peace of mind, maybe for themselves. You know that apology you never got and you go, well, I forgive them anyway. That's on me. The only thing about that is it doesn't build trust. And it doesn't help the future nearly so much as when we actually recognize the wrong. Admit the wrong. Repent of the wrong. And reach an agreement with another person that will make the change of behavior that messed us up in the first place go away. If we skip that repentance part, our relationship is doomed to never trust them again land, isn't it? Here's a motto from Never Trust Them Again Land. Apology without change is manipulation. Ooh, I like that one. Let's hear that again. Apology without change is manipulation. That's gameplay, not trust building. The reason we forgive is peace. Yes, indeed. The reason we repent, though, is relationship. It's trust building. What do you have if you have no trust? Nothing. Trust is the basis for any real relationship, and trust is the basis of faith. Just try separating those. Try transplanting something else in its place. Whatever that poor substitute is, for the trust that we don't receive and give is our idol. God's very linear that way, straight A to B. He presents us with one direct route to himself. And every time something stands in our way, it's a blockade, a speed bump, a sin, he points it out. And when we eventually figure that piece out, if we didn't see it right away, and we discern what our idols are, and we tell God, I don't want this thing between us. I'm repenting. I did it. I did it. This thing is coming between you and me. Help me, Lord. He does. Now, I don't often title sermons and bulletins because God can change my direction pretty easily, even at 2 a.m., depending on what he shows me in a week. And then the bulletin would be wrong and somebody would be calling Connie, right? But I titled the latest rendition of this sermon, Prune or Doom. And I'm sure any number of folks that would read that title would wonder what kind of hellfire and damnation was going on in this church or if your preacher had had too much coffee this week. But that type of all law and no grace, no gospel is not what we teach and preach and believe. We believe in fruitfulness. We believe in production. We believe in light and baptismal water that's powerful enough to take a sad little Charlie Brown Christmas type fig tree and go with us through the excruciating process of knowing our idols are ourselves and he's pruning us so that we can hear Jesus say, you don't need to suffer eternally. You are not doomed forever. I am and I'm here for you. Trust in me. Leave your idol idols. Meet me where the clipper hits the branches. Let's have a real, fulfilling relationship that is totally built on trust because I'm the only one in your life that is 100% every single time trustable in every circumstance and I will give you everlasting life. Even a dormant fig tree can produce again when it's been made vulnerable enough to try again differently. Jesus' advice to us was this. Dig a little deeper. Add some effective fertilizer. And Jesus' largest message for us today is, there is no doom for those who prune. 
Thanks be to God. Amen.